Space is a pretty colourful place, isn't it? I mean, look at all the amazing images we've got from the Hubble over the years, and now the James Webb Space Telescope. But how is it when you look up at the stars at night, you just see blackness with pinpricks of light? Where are all the colours we see in the Pillars of Creation or the Horsehead Nebula and the countless other images? They've become some of the most iconic images of space ever released, often turning up on posters, book covers and desktop wallpapers. But here's the surprising thing. If you were actually there, floating in your spacesuit just a few light years away, you wouldn't see anything like it. In fact, you'd probably be left wondering if you were in the wrong place or looking in the wrong direction. So why is it that telescopes like the Hubble or the James Webb Space Telescope can produce these dazzling colourful views, yet our own eyes would struggle to see hardly anything at all? Well, it comes down to a few simple but important facts. The limitations of human eyesight, how telescopes collect their light and process it, and the way astronomers turn raw data into the images we all recognise. There is a big difference between what's actually out there in space, what our eyes can actually pick up, and what the cameras and sensors on the space telescopes can reveal. The biggest part of a problem is us, well to be more accurate, our eyes. Our eyes have evolved over millions of years to work in daylight under the light of an average sized G-type main sequence star or yellow dwarf, which is what we call the sun. As such, our human vision is tuned to a very narrow slice of the electromagnetic spectrum, the part which we call visible light. This runs from violet in the very short wavelength through to blue, green, yellow and to red in the longer wavelength end. But that's only a tiny fraction of all the radiation out there. The universe is filled with radio waves, microwaves, infrared, ultraviolet, x-rays and gamma rays, and we can't see any of it. Even within the visible light spectrum, our eyes are poor in comparison to a telescope. At night, our pupils can open to about 7 millimeters across. That's enough to let in a decent amount of starlight, but it's nothing in comparison to a telescope mirror that's 2, 3, 4 or 6 meters across. Hubble's mirror is 2.4 meters, which means it gathers millions of times more light than your eye ever could. The James Webb with its 6.5 meter mirror gathers even more. The more light you collect, the fainter and more distant the object you can see. That's why if you were to go outside and look up, the Orion Nebula might appear as a faint grey smudge. But through a large amateur telescope, it would start to show its structure. And through the Hubble, it becomes a breathtaking, detailed nebula cloud. It's not like the light isn't there, it's just our eyes aren't sensitive enough to see it. So why is this? When I'm writing a script for videos like this, one of the ways I like to work is to dictate the script into Word, because A, I'm a pretty bad typist and spend more time fixing typing errors than actually writing it, and B, you can get into the flow of things and not be distracted, in my case by point A. But one of my pet peeves with Word and its dictation system is that it keeps stopping as soon as you move the mouse to look at another window, which is often what I need to do. However, with applaud Notepin, who are the sponsor of this video, I don't have such concerns. Once I start capturing speech, it'll just keep going no matter what else I'm doing. And it'll use ChatGPT to convert it into text automatically. Now it's not just for scripting. How many times you've been doing something and wished someone was taking notes? Maybe you're giving a speech or a lecture, or holding a meeting, a training session, or dictating voice memos, or just talking out ideas that will need to be converted into written text. With applaud note pin, you don't need to find that person. It can do it all for you, and far quicker than any human could. Once the transcription is done, it gives you a complete summary with the overall theme, takeaways, highlights, key points, and a detailed explanation if required. But this is AI, so you can also ask it to do smart tasks, such as search previous recordings for information to provide summaries or make a compound to-do list, or answering general questions about the subject and maybe even translating it into one or more languages. It can even voice print people so when it hears them, what they say will be labelled with their name in the text. The Plaud Notepin weighs just 22 grams 
and with its magnetic pin or clip, just attach it to your clothing and press to start recording. Notepin is also compatible with both Android and Apple iOS devices. So if you've ever had a genius idea and lost it, get the Plaud Notepin today and use the code CD10 to get $10 off using the link in the description below and never lose a thought again. Our eyes use two kinds of cells, rods and cones. Rods are very sensitive to faint light, but don't see color, while cones detect color, but only in brighter light. That's why in a dark room, everything looks gray. Out in the nebula, the light levels are so low that your vision would be dominated by rods. You lose most of your color perception. At best, you might see a faint red tint in something like the Orion Nebula, because the hydrogen gives off a relatively strong red emission, but you'd still be nothing like the bright crimson glows you see in the images. Now compare that to what telescopes can do. Unlike your eyes, which see all the visible light at once, telescopes can use filters to isolate very specific wavelengths. For example, Hubble can often take images not only through the normal red, green, and blue, but through filters that capture hydrogen alpha light, oxygen three light, or sulfur two light. Each of these wavelengths corresponds to an element in the gas, glowing brightly as it's ionized by the energy from nearby stars. The telescope takes separate black and white images through each filter, often with very long time exposures lasting hours. These long exposures allow the camera sensors to collect huge amounts of faint light that would otherwise be invisible. When these images are processed here on Earth, these different images have different colors assigned to each one. This is known as false color photography, a process of using color to show things that we would not otherwise be able to see. Sometimes they try to match what the human eye might see if it was sensitive enough, but often they use what's called a representative color. For example, they might assign sulfur to red, hydrogen to green, and oxygen to blue. When they combine them, you get a colorful composite image that highlights not only the structure, but the chemistry of the nebula. The famous Hubble palette images are made this way. They're not fake. They are maps of real data translated into colors that we can perceive. The James Webb Space Telescope takes this even further because it sees primarily in infrared. Infrared is light, which is completely invisible to us. We only feel it as heat, but it's incredibly useful in astronomy because it can pass through dust clouds that block visible light. That's why Webb's view of the pillars of creation looks so different from Hubble's. Where Hubble shows glowing gas on the outside, Webb reveals the stars forming on the inside of the gaseous pillars. So those infrared wavelengths that we can't see have to be translated into visible colors, otherwise we'd see nothing at all. The images you see from NASA are the result of this translation process. Without it, you just have a set of dull black and white photos that only specialists could interpret. The colors aren't added to make them look pretty, although it's a nice side effect and great PR, they're added to show real physical information. Red might represent a cooler dust, blue might show hotter gas, and green might highlight areas rich in hydrogen. Each image is a kind of scientific diagram, but one that also happens to be visually stunning, which is why there are so many different variations depending upon what the interest of the research is. So let's imagine if you were actually there, floating near the Horsehead Nebula, what would you actually see? Well, the Horsehead Nebula is a dark cloud of dust silhouetted against the brighter background of gas. To your eyes, it will just look like a patch of darkness, a vague shadow cutting across the stars behind. The dramatic shape we see in the photographs would barely be visible, and the surrounding gas, which glows faintly in hydrogen emission, it would be so dim that you would only be able to see the faintest smudges. You would certainly never see the deep crimson glow or the intricate details that long exposure images bring out. The pillars of creation are also another good example. In Hubble's images, they look like towering golden fingers reaching into space. In reality, the density of the gas is so low that it's almost a vacuum compared to the Earth's atmosphere. A cubic meter of nebula might contain just a few hundred molecules of gas, whereas the air you're breathing in now 
is about 10 quintillion molecules per cubic meter. In nice round numbers, about 2.5 times 10 to the power of 25. So the pillars wouldn't look solid and they wouldn't be glowing brightly. At the most, they would look like dark, ghostly shapes blocking out some of the stars behind them. They'd be impressive in scale, several light years tall, but visually, to the human eye, they'd be really rather underwhelming. And this raises a question of whether NASA's images are real. The term false colour photography doesn't help, because some people equate false to fake, and something that is not real or made up. Some say that they are misleading because they don't represent what you would actually see. But in reality, they are more accurate than our eyes could ever be. The colours highlight things we would otherwise miss completely, like the distribution of elements, the presence of dust or the formation of stars. You can't see radio waves, microwaves, infrared, x-rays or gamma rays, but they are all still there. If anything, it's our eyes that are giving us a false impression by being so limited. There's also the question of exposure time. A single glance of our eyes lasts maybe a tenth of a second. We see in real time. The light does not accumulate in our eyes. A telescope image might be built up over hours or days of exposure, collecting and accumulating the effects of photons of light the entire time making the image brighter the longer the exposure goes on. That's why faint structures emerge in a telescope photos that we could never see in real time. It's the same reason why astrophotographers with amateur telescopes can capture stunning images of galaxies by stacking long exposures together, even though those same galaxies are barely visible through the eyepiece. In the end, the reason why we'll never see the pillars of creation or the Horsehead Nebula the way NASA shows them is simply because we're not built for it. Our eyes are too small, too limited in range, and too insensitive to low light. Our telescopes, on the other hand, are like superpower extensions of our senses. They can capture the faintest glimmers of light from the farthest objects ever detected and collect information across the entire electromagnetic spectrum and translate it into images we can understand. So the next time you question why we spend so much money, billions of dollars on telescopes like the Hubble, the James Webb, and huge ground-based ones, it's because without them, we are blind to everything that lies in what is just blackness of space to us, but in reality, is filled with countless stars and galaxies stretching back to the beginning of time. Those pretty pictures aren't lies or fake images, their windows into a reality which is out there and our eyes alone could never perceive. If you choose to believe they are fake or don't exist, then that's up to you. But the rest of the universe will go on and not care one iota what you think or believe. So thanks for watching. As always, thanks to our patrons for their ongoing support. If you'd like to keep these videos coming, check in the link in the description. And don't forget to thumbs up, share and subscribe.